Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, let the words that you present to us today be upon our hearts and minds. Help us to draw closer to you and find confidence in your love for, for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but if there is one area of my spiritual life that I've had a lifelong struggle with, it would be my prayer life. I suspect, I suspect and even believe that if I were to ask you, how's your prayer life? You would answer at best, not as good as it could be. Or at worst, what prayer life? Now you would think I would know how. I've been a, a Christian since I was baptized at 10 days old. I went to a parochial elementary school. I went to uh, Sunday school. Went to confirmation. Went to Concordia High School in Portland. And uh, I went to two Lutheran colleges and the seminary. And I have been a pastor for 40 years. And still, I confess to you that prayer is still a mystery to me and a struggle. Even the disciples had problems with prayer at least when it was compared to Jesus. So our gospel reading today begins with these words. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. It that wasn't that the disciples didn't know how to pray, but there was something different about Jesus and his prayer life. Jesus' prayer life was especially important to Luke, the gospel writer. Luke has a greater emphasis on prayer than the other three gospels. Many times in synoptic events, Luke includes comments about Jesus praying that are not found in the other gospels. Jesus was praying at his baptism before the heavens opened. Jesus spends the night praying to God before selecting his 12 disciples. Jesus is praying before he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am and who do you say I am? Jesus is praying on the mountain before the transfiguration. And here Jesus was praying before the disciples asked him to teach them to pray. All of these are not found in any of the other gospel writings. The Lord's Prayer is found in two places in the gospels. In Matthew, it is part of Jesus' teaching ministry within the Sermon on the Mount. And it seems to make more sense there then in Luke, where he's very casual about the whole thing, he just says, Jesus was praying in a certain place. There is no clue about what that where that place is, which is unlike Luke's writings, for he is very careful about going, no, noting times and places. We must assume that there is a reason for this. My guess is that the disciples saw Jesus praying so often that it was, as a matter of fact, difficult to recall the price day and location of the time he gave them this particular model of prayer to follow. Had Jesus prayed rarely or on certain ceremonial occasions, maybe then it would be easy and important to add a few more details. 
But Jesus prayed so regularly that in the mind of the disciples, it all blurred together. When somebody prays as much as Jesus did, it really doesn't make any difference the precise place or where the incident took place. The point is that Jesus prayed all the time to the extent that the disciples finally just had to know how to do it themselves. The disciples were not asking for words to say when praying. What the disciples wanted was not a litany of key phrases or a checklist of prayer items. What they were inquiring about was how they could, in imitation of their master, turn the entirety of their lives into an extended act of prayer. The same as they observed was in the case of Jesus himself. Or as Paul said to the Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all situations, circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And is that not what we desire also? Scripture tells us to pray unceasingly, but it never says that prayer is easy. Now, this is not original with me, but perhaps our trouble with prayer is that our primary teaching about prayer is a cult machine. Think about it. We put in the correct chains, make our selection, and get what we want. Isn't that what Jesus is saying when he said in, in, verse, in the verse, I, I, and I tell you, ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. So we offer the coins of our wants and needs, our beliefs and good behavior, we tell God what we want and expect what we ask for. All this works fine until it doesn't. Cult machines are great until the cult takes your money but gives you nothing in return. Or when you want classic cult, you get diet coke. Look how we respond when that happens. We get mad. We push buttons again and again. We tip it from side to side. We did our part and expect it to do its. And it's not so much different with prayer. Some will get angry. Some will feel hurt or betrayed, lose faith, and even leave the church. You know, one thing that I never heard as a pastor, I, people ask me a lot of questions, but there's one thing that I have never heard someone ask, and that is, why was my prayer answered? Why did I receive exactly what I asked for? I know prayer is answered, and sometimes we do ask and receive search and find, knock, and the door is open. But the question is always there when people ask and do not receive, search and do not find, knock, and the door never opens. This is something we all do. Now, I wish I could tell you why some prayers seem to be answered and others seem unanswered. But I've heard some really bad answers to the question of answered prayer. And then here's just a, a partial list. And, and know that some of this even comes from pastors. One is, you didn't pray hard enough. Or, you didn't have enough faith. Or, you were asking for the wrong thing. Or, everything happens for a reason, or something better is coming. 
These answers are nothing but an attempt to bolster a cult machine understanding of prayer. And it's wrong. It hurts people and perverts who and how God is. I don't understand how prayer works, but I know this. It's not about the coins that we give. It's not a mechanical process. It's not a transaction. It's not a transmission of information to God. In the midst of not knowing or understanding, maybe the most and best we can do is echo the disciples' request. Lord, teach us to pray. We are always beginners, always learning how to pray. Jesus' response is not an explanation of prayer or how it works. He does not offer a formula or magic words. He does not give us the correct change for the cult machine. Instead, Jesus teaches about who and how God is when you pray the Lord's Prayer. It begins with the word, Father, hallowed be your name. God is holy and we are his divine children. Holy sons and daughters. There is a given, a reality, before we even open our minds, our mouths and before we offer our coins or make a selection. That relationship already exists. Prayer is about relationship and presence. We are not telling God something that God doesn't know. We are reminding ourselves of what already is, always has been, and always will be. That relationship means our life, our existence, our very being comes from our Father. Jesus speaks of that as daily bread. We are too often convinced that we are or must be independent and self-sufficient. Prayer reminds us that we are unself-sufficient. We ask each day for our daily bread. That doesn't mean that we are deficient, but that our sufficiency comes not from ourselves, but from God. It means that God sustains and nourishes our life. That another way of talk, but the, that's another way of talking about relationship and presence. Those lines about forgiveness, ours and others. Again, this is about relationship and presence with God and with each other. If prayer, as Jesus teaches us, really is all about relationships and presence, then there is only one answer to prayer. And that answer is God. I don't mean God answers our prayers, but that God is the answer to our prayer. God's presence, life, love, beauty, generosity, compassion, forgiveness, wisdom, justice, mercy. God gives himself as the answer to our prayer. Jesus tells us, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the, whole, the, heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Perhaps the greatest difficulty of prayer is that sometimes we just want to offer the coins and push the button. We really don't want God. We want something from God. We want God to change our circumstances. And while God can and does sometimes change circumstances, I am convinced God more often than not changes us. God's self-giving sustains, nourishes, strengthens, empowers, emboldens, and enables us to face the circumstances of life. We do so sometimes 
with joy and gratitude, other times with pain and loss, but always with God. On my better days, I know this, and that's enough. On those other days, it's, Lord, teach me to pray. You know, I think a better example of true prayer is the musical Fiddler on the Roof. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that it was not the purpose of the musical to teach us how to pray, but it is a great lesson for all of us. The main character is a Jewish milkman. Throughout the movie, he is always having a conversation with God. It is much more than a conversation between a man and his God. It's a conversation with a friend. He talks with him, complains to him, asks him for help, jokes with him, cries with him, laughs with him, cries with him, gets frustrated with him, loves him just as he loves us at all times of the day. This type of relationship God desires to have with us. And it changes everything in our lives for the better because we see everything in the light of the Father who is our friend and loves us dearly. Amen. The peace of God.